Okay, um, thanks everybody for showing up. This is the new Comics Minimalism panel, so make sure you're in the right place. If you're looking for Seth, he's in the other room. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, D I'm Derek Badman. I'm going to be moderating this panel as we try to figure out what comics minimalism is, um, hopefully together. And I'm just going to, I guess we'll start with having everybody introduce themselves in case you don't know who all these guys are. So if you guys could all, maybe we can start with Frank. Just say who you are, maybe what your latest book is or something yeah. like that. Uh, my name is Frank Santoro. I, do, I have a book uh, on picture box called Pompeii. Um, I also do the comics workbook Tumblr, and I write for the Comics Journal. And that's it. I, uh, my name is John McNaught. Um, I, my last book is called Dockwood by Nobrow Press. And um, and yeah, that's 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 me. Eisner nominated. <laughs> Dark wood. <laughs> uh, my name's Simon Morton. I'm uh, from the UK. I live around the corner from John, although I don't think he knows that. <laughs> and um, <laughs> anyway, and um, uh, and I've been making comics for about five years. They're uh, mostly autobiographical, but in the last couple of years, I've really been kind of moving into minimal or uh, lazy, um, very few line kind of work, and that's, I guess, why I'm here. We should get for a coffee sometime. Yeah, we should. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Christopher Adams. I was born in Connecticut, but I've lived most of my life in Maryland. Uh, I've mostly played music through high school and a few years after, and then a couple years ago I moved to Arizona, and uh, I had been working on some art stuff and decided to do some comics. And my latest published book is called Strong Eye Contact, but my latest book is called Yule Log, and I finished it on Wednesday. <laughs> you made it. Yeah, uh, I made up a mock-up copy with tape. <laughs> uh, my name's Andrew White. I'm a contributor to Frank's Comics Workbook Tumblr. Um, I do one-page comics for him. That's probably my most minimalist work. Um, I also self-published a book called Black Pillars, um, the first issue of that project. That's my most recent work. Um, and I put out a book through Retrofit Comics earlier this year. Okay, and again, I'm, I'm Derek Badman. Um, you, I do a website called Mad Ink Beard where I also make comics and write about things. Probably pretty minimalist in many ways. Um, so minimalism, I know when I think minimalism, the first thing I tend to think of is like a white cube in a gallery square or like a a piece of metal slab against the wall. There's that kind of fine art type of minimalist sculpture. Um, and I thought that might be an interesting way to think about minimalism in comics because a lot of that work was kind of a reaction against much more complicated art and abstract art um, and kind of a return to um, something simpler and also something that's more about material. And I think a lot of the work um, all these guys do is in some ways both simplification and a lot about the material they're using, um, and and kind of making that process, the process and the material they use a little more explicit rather than hiding it in, you know, carefully inked work that's all the pencils have been erased and it's been slickly colored and that it's like kind of a sheen. Uh, I think material is a big part for for everyone here, and um, maybe we could start uh, if anyone wants to talk about how you what you think about of. As far as minimalism, um, if you think about it in your work at all, if it's maybe even if it's something you don't think applies to your work at all, I'll I'll say that I think it half applies uh, because one of the reasons I've tried to make stuff that say doesn't have lots of backgrounds is because I'd like the uh, characters or objects or shapes to actually be pretty like lush and sometimes very fully rendered. But since comics are meant to be read, it sort of doesn't make a whole lot of sense for every panel to be a big mush that you have to sort out. So I feel like instead of just doing contour lines, which could be very minimal, I sort of make shapes as opposed to outlines and filling them in so that you have the shapes to look at, which are sort of dense, but then they might lack the backgrounds. So it's kind of a mix of being very sparse but very fleshed out. So I feel like the minimalist tag uh, applies maybe more in how I think about it than necessarily everything that's happening on the page. And I think if we had slides up, we could show you an example of Chris's work, but a lot of it, um, strong eye contact in particular, 
Um, the panels are very focused on the figure or a specific object in the scene, and then there's a lot of white space um, in the background. In my latest book, Yule Log, which I just finished on Wednesday, uh, a lot of it is more lush than my previous work, but there is a spread which sort of exemplifies that a bit. <laughs> Can I ask a question of John? Um, do Go you, for it. So, are you making separate uh, color separations? Like, are you working out at one? Um, yeah, I do. Uh, I, I paint kind of two or three um, color separations for each uh, page of the comic. So it's. Uh, I tend to sort of trace the whole whole page, draw the whole thing out, and. Um, because I, I work as a printmaking technician, so I, I, everything I do is kind of uh, in that kind of world, really. And a lot of the materials I use um, are similar to screen printing. Mm -hmm. So I do tend to try and keep maybe two, sometimes three. But for example, when you make the final file for the printer, mm -hmm. like it's all layered as one file, or you know, it's a. Do you understand? Yeah, yeah. It's um, it's all. Uh, it's layered, it's like a file with the, the three different layers and we kind of assign a different Channels. channel, uh, like mm -hmm. a different, uh, and I choose the, choose the, um, the Pantone colors. So it always takes weeks and weeks to sort of decide exactly what color to, to, to make sure they all sort of fit together well. Um, so, you, so you have your, your draw, you know, your drawing and then your, like of the page maybe in pencil and then you'll do the blue plate the red plate, the yellow, whatever yeah, that might well, be. What I've been doing um, recently, I, I kind of everything I've done, I've kind of adapted a bit, and I, I guess kind of because to begin with, I was really making prints, and um, and then I've been, you know, I started trying, you know, started drawing comics, and um, I'm kind of adapting the sort of way I work to be more kind of. Uh, in sort of uh, learning things from looking at comics, and so now I I try and make all of the uh, the black kind of the, the top layer, the, mm -hmm. the sort of darkest color, hold kind of all of the information. I kind of want everything to be all the sort of visual information to be held there, mm -hmm. and then the colors kind of almost kind of give the atmosphere and, and back mm -hmm. it up a bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. But then I wonder about. Can I just do this? It's good. I wonder about that with Simon's thing because like so if he's taking the original drawing and then making you know a new guide like sometimes in your work i see he has very few lines that might comprise a whole page but you can see it underneath and i sometimes wonder if he has a really roughed out drawing underneath and then maybe you're maybe like making a new version not on top mm. but it might be like you have a, a thumbnail mm. so to speak and i wonder the difference between like your roughs and your finished pages do you know what i mean yeah, so I think that like maybe my process in that sense is, and it kind of relates to a couple of things really, is that I kind of started doing, moving towards sort of a minimal kind of a space for the comics, um, partly out of speed, but partly out of um, wanting to try and capture a kind of particular essence or a particular kind of moment in the line. So when I make, um, when I do a lot of the, the roughs as it were, I kind of, I will draw very quickly from life sort of a bit of a, there we go, and then that, that would be the thing that inform, informs like the, the final piece, and sometimes it is just, I will just draw a panel around a sketch, and then that will be a panel, and sometimes it will be, I will put them next to each other, like you say, and just kind of take a slightly more considered approach to copying in some extent, but the thing that I'm really trying to do is, is, is kind of cut out as much sort of process as possible, so that the, um, and so that the, the pencil marks, I only use um, thick pencils these days as well, and I don't really, Use. I sometimes use a bit of blue pencil, maybe to briefly kind of lay out a page, but I try and make the first mark the only mark. And that um, um, can lead to quite a lot of wasted paper, but um, at the same time, it's quite a freeing way of doing things for me. Is, is trying to um, kind of make that as, cut out the process as much as possible, is, is that because you want to retain something of like the spontaneity of it? Or, I mean, why, why is it you want, is it just, just because you're lazy. <laughs> I'm incredibly lazy. Um, 
No, I think it's it's actually it is it is a desire to kind of keep that spontaneity. And I think that when I first started making comics, I was sort of making comics the way I thought you were supposed to make comics. So there was a lot of kind of you know thumbnailing, endless thumbnail, draw out the panels and making sure the characters look right, and then inking and all of those processes. And then at some point, I sort of realised that was kind of a there isn't any one way to do that kind of self-expression. You can do whatever you like. And when I realised that 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 was kind of an in particular industrial way of doing comics, I kind of moved away from that into um, uh, trying to work, I mean, partly more quickly. I have a day job. I don't. I don't do comics for a living, um, which means that I only have a limited space of time where I can work. So, I would it would enable me to kind of process things a lot quicker by being a lot faster by kind of capturing that spontaneity. It was kind of it kind of went hand in hand, I guess, the desire to kind of experiment with it with a different kind of way of, of making art, but also because it's all autobiographical, and it's all very much about kind of making sense of my life as I go along. Um, and trying to take a moment and go, oh, okay, what have I just seen? What have I just done? And capturing that essence is sort of a, that's the other thing, I think, that goes with it. Okay. Um, uh, Andrew, maybe um, a question for you. You kind of have two, you almost have two types of work you've been doing recently. Yeah. You've got like Black Pillars and We Will, we will Remain. Mm -hmm. We Will Remain, um, which are much more finished. They're inked, they're, they're narrative stories. Um, and then you've got all these pieces you've been doing for Comics Workbook um, that are much more kind of, of the moment, or and they, the narratively, they feel like moments, and and they're very loose and colorful. I wonder if you could talk about how you think of those two types of work differently, if you do, and like how your process might differ a little. Yeah, well, they they started out as being quite different. Um, you know, the the brief backstory is that Frank asked me to contribute these one page comics, similar to the work that he'd been doing for his comics workbook Tumblr. Um, but I think, um, you know, to to talk about the two different types of work, it's kind of starting to move together a little bit in that the comics workbook pages um, are becoming, or I'm trying to make them perhaps a little bit more dense and bring in some of those narrative ideas that you know I work on in the comics that um, do in fact take up the most of my time. But you know, with the narrative work as well, um, you know, I'm very interested in kind of trying to draw connections between um, minimalism or abstraction, kind of, you know, using abstract shapes in comics and placing them in a narrative context and trying to see, you know, where you can go with some of those ideas, but, you know, because, um, you know, doing shorter comics for, or one page comics for Comics Workbook, um, you know, you kind of have to be much more direct um, in terms of your use of each panel, in terms of some of the, some of the images that you're drawing. Um, and so I think that's something I've, you know, kind of definitely taken into the longer form work. Which is which is yeah less less minimalist I would say. I have a question for Frank. Yeah. All right. All right. So Simon and I were talking a little bit before about the fact that I'm, I'm a graduate of Frank's uh, comics correspondence course. That's right. Uh, Simon is a dropout. Um, I am very lazy. <laughs> But, but, you know, I mean, Simon talked in the, touched on this a little bit, um, the fact that, you know, kind, kind of, you need to have a bit of confidence um, to be able to, you know, just do that initial scribble and have that be your final work. You know, that's kind of a, a bit of a hump for a lot of people to get over. Um, and I think we agreed that, that kind of the confidence to do that, or at least kind of the recognition that that was perhaps an important thing, um, came from Frank's class. So Frank, I'd love to hear you talk about some of those things oh, a little bit. You're gonna make me blush. Um. <laughs> No, I appreciate you saying that. I, I, I just want to encourage people to make, I don't want to say sloppy comics, but structured comics that are fast. I think a lot of comics makers are really caught up in making things perfect and waste a lot of their time and maybe worry themselves to death that things don't look as good as they should. And, um, you know, I always remind people that Jaime Hernandez's panels are not any bigger usually than three by five inches. So every drawing that Jaime's making is about that big. So if you start making drawings, kind of carrying around a little sketchbook or pack of index cards or something, and you're sketching from life, or you're sketching your uh, cat or your dog, you know, kind of like, think, maybe trying to draw something that uh, is beloved to you is very important because you try really hard. And if you've ever tried to draw a, you know, a, a loved one's face or something over and over again, it looks different every time. It doesn't look like that person. 
And then if you have a stylistic way of drawing faces and you only draw faces in that particular way, you're kind of missing out sometimes in the documentation of that person. And so comics doesn't have to be a um, hermetically sealed language, you know? And I think a lot of makers are caught up in the history of comics and what comics should look like. And I think that you can make comics like different than anything. And so the confidence to make those marks is something that I would encourage in my students. And um, I want it to just, I'm, I'm, I'm honestly you know, hoping that Andrew's work inspires other people because he's showing a different side of that. And same with Simon. You know, it, he shows a very different side of that, and I think it's really hard to make comics the way Simon makes comics. And I think that we're seen as, not we, I won't speak for everybody, but sometimes I'm seen as like, it's like being a poet or something. It's like the lowest thing on the food chain, you know? Like, you know, you can't draw. Look at your comics. Suck, man. And it's like, because I don't do this fully rendered style or something, and then I just, I think that's such a, bizarre argument to even be having anymore in 2013. Well, uh, you know? To follow up with what you were saying, like I, I, I sometimes get pretty bored by the obsession with perfection in comics. Uh, and a lot of my sort of visual arts background, uh, when I was very young, I read like The Far Side and things like that. But uh, after that, I mean, I was mostly interested in uh, what would be considered fine arts. Uh, you know, paintings and drawings and single images. And uh, when I decided to start making comics, uh, one thing that I found carried over from uh, working on paintings or drawings is that often, uh, if you want to draw something that looks very real and vivid, spending the least amount of time possible on it will often make it look more real and alive than if you sit there getting, you know, finger cramps. Definitely. Uh, for instance, in my book, Strong Eye Contact, which is out from 2D Cloud. <laughs> Sorry, I figured I'd do a couple of those obnoxious things. Uh, there's a picture of a waffle, and uh, it's in watercolor, and I essentially just drew a circle and then made a grid on it and then made the grid lines sort of tan brown and then made in between a darker brown really sloppily. And uh, the three or four people who have seen the book have commented that the waffle looks very real compared to the other drawings. And uh, if you break it down, the waffle was drawn about as unrealistically as possible. You know, I didn't obsess about all the little, you know, nooks and crannies and things, even though that's an uh, English muffin. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, that was just an example uh, from how I've worked where you know, if I try to draw something very real with a pencil, uh, I could sit there for four hours and maybe it would look really real, but then it would also look very scary because it would look very, like, fake, sort of the un uncanny valley. Mm -hmm. but, it, but if you make something very quickly, uh, you know, as though you might, uh, you know, if you've got diarrhea or something and have to do it really fast before you get to the bathroom, uh, often that urgency and quickness and not really caring uh, will help something look a little more vivid and jump off the page a bit, which I think is something that comics could use more of. I think uh, what you're talking about, like that waffle, I mean, that, that kind of filling in the gaps is almost like the basis of comics, is taking something that's, that's abstracted, that's not fully there, and, and kind of filling in your details. The jump between, I mean, that's like McLeod's classic kind of thing of, of the, you know, filling in the shapes of the face or whatever. But that seems like so inherent to comics, like throughout throughout the history of that. Yeah, and, and I think uh, art in general, like someone like Cezanne, whose work I don't find very enjoyable, uh, but lots of people like to think about it, and it can be interesting to think about because uh, I guess as brilliant as people like to talk about him, he apparently just saw everything as circles and squares. Uh, and I think for some people, especially if you're doing comics, which is very much about making things sort of uh, like pictograms, uh, you know, breaking something like a waffle down to like a bunch of squares inside of a circle can certainly help uh, make it come across as a waffle very quickly without it necessarily being like a photograph of a waffle. Th that was less interesting than my last comment, sorry. <laughs> Bore everybody by telling you about how I drew uh, geese in my book, Grand Gestures. Oh, well, that geese are great. See, I'm copying him now. Um, I had a couple of things I wanted to kind of say, leading on from 
from all the comments so far, really, and it's sort of about... So there's another kind of degree as, as to why I, I agree. Everything that's about spontaneity, about not privileging, like overprivileging the images, that's definitely something that I, I learned from starting Frank's course, was um, this, you know, you know, you do a drawing, you do a sketch, you really like the sketch, so you're going to keep it at all, you know, in any way you possibly can, you're going to overprivilege. Actually, you know what? Don't do that. Do another one, do another one, do another one, do another one. And then at some point, you kind of just let it be more spontaneous and more fluid, and that's a really good thing. Um, so all of those things um, definitely, I think, are true. The rejection of perfection, the rejection of the kind of a particular kind of way of doing things. Um, so I'm quite contrary as well when it comes to doing stuff like that. If I'm, if I assume that I'm supposed to do something some way. I don't, I don't really like it. It makes me feel uncomfortable. So I'll try and do it a bit differently. But there's a, there's a kind of a social thing for for why I draw in the way that I do, which is like sort of leaving the trace of the pencil, leaving the mark. And is that, I think that everybody can create their own visual, strong, powerful, important personal visual language by drawing, even if you can't draw really well or really realistically or any of those, you know, pointless um, kind of uh, enlightenment terms or whatever it might be. And so that I like this idea that like somebody could pick it up and go, oh, that, that's a pencil line. I, I, could, I could do this, not necessarily in a dismissive way, but that it could be an inspiration for people to try and create something, create their own visual language and their own way of making sense of the world as well. So it's sort of it's kind of almost like a, a small p political act for me as well to draw that. And I don't come from like a an art fine art background, so I guess that my rejection, if it's a rejection, it's a rejection of a particular kind of established way of doing things that empowers people to do stuff for themselves rather than necessarily understanding um, art, which to be honest, I, I don't generally. John, what are your sketches like? Um I kind of, um, I, I think my sketches are kind of quite, they can be quite rigid sometimes actually. Like I, I try and, I mean, I, I, I tend to, um, I tend to kind of almost collage when I'm, when I'm planning a page. Um, and, and often I'll, I'll sort of do lots of, I, I work, quite rigidly with panels most of the time I kind of enjoy the rhythm of the panels and, and it's a kind of the way of, 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 of telling the story um, but I never really have a plan I, I don't really feel quite like I'm in control of of quite how it's read and I, I almost prefer to kind of to try things and sit back and, and look. The particular um, drawing or the page itself? I, I'm, I, the, the page itself, really. What about the particular drawing? The particular drawing, okay, so um, they're, they're just kind of line, they're very, very, they're, they're simple really, you know, just kind of, often I'll, I'll, I'll actually work on, on tiny squares of tracing paper and I'll, I'll draw, for example, I'll draw a, a, a character and then I'll kind of keep overlaying almost I, I, almost like kind of animation really I'll just kind of keep the figure kind of moving mm -hmm. along and things so they're quite simple sketches and it's um, the whole book's kind of drawn out like that to begin with mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so when you make f f color fields that are shaped you know that are, there's no lines around them uh, you know you were saying there's usually you have the layer that holds all the information but I, you know, I think in a lot of your work there's open color Fields that hold a lot of the information. Yeah, yeah. yeah I try and. Try so that's and a tracing paper layer then. Um, it, I I get I try and get all the information in the in the lines of the sketch. The sketch is just kind of a pencil line, and then I kind of overlay a kind of a, a transparent film to paint the ink on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As I, and I kind of tend to do it fairly intuitively. And so um, each panel might have its own, you know, group of. Uh, group to make that drawing, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, absolutely, it kind of... Because this is something I'd like to touch on, and we could all talk about how we construct pages, but uh, I think a lot of comics is cut up in, you know, traditionally you make the page, let's say, 10 by 15 or something, and then you pencil it, and you, you have maybe a certain degree of how much you pencil or how little you pencil, and then you might ink it, how much you ink it, how little you ink it, and I think we all probably really don't do that so much, you know? It's more just making the page, and it might be more direct, everybody has their own way, but, you know, again, comics' language is changing, and I think it's a really interesting moment in comics, you know, for that. So. We could all talk about our process. Andrew, Chris? Anyone? Uh, 
let's see. Most of the time, if I make a piece of art, I maybe have an idea, and I'll, like, say if with a book, uh, I'll sort of make a little pamphlet, and I'll sort of divide the pages up how I want, and then just kind of draw very simple stick figures. Not really stick figures, but, uh, you know, just like a circle for a head type thing. And basically, I'll just go with that, and then I'll start on the page that I want it to be, and it will be the final page. And uh, since I kind of don't like drawing very much, uh, I don't know why I decided to work on comic books, but uh, I'll often just start the page, start in the top left-hand corner, and work down to the bottom right-hand corner. And uh, often I'll work in watercolor or crayon or ink or something that's very unerasable. Uh, and essentially, whatever I end up with when I get to the bottom right-hand corner, I'll take a couple days to justify in my mind that I don't have to redo it, and then I'll move on to the next page. There's that laziness aspect again. Uh, it's, it's not so much laziness as I feel like, say, I finished the page and I didn't like the page. I feel like it's not going to benefit me to make the page again, to make it better in a way that anybody who's not me might not even realize. I think that's really important. I think we we all spend a way too much time on pages and we'll obsess and redraw stuff. And if you asked anybody else, like, what's the difference between this page and this page? Most people will say nothing. And But in your mind, you think there's, oh, we have to change all this stuff. So I, it's great to hear that, like, you, what, you give yourself a couple days and then, you know, so something like that I think is really important. You have some, something to show, Simon? Yeah, when well, I just think about process, but I think that what you're saying about, yeah, that's, that's kind of why, that's the first, the working first bit for me kind of is about, is precisely about that, about just if you, you know all of the information on the page and all the information you didn't put on the page and all the information that you might could have possibly put on the page. And obviously no reader knows that. So you live with a, with a hundred potential versions of the page and that's not really very healthy. Like, you know, when you're saying like, you know, cartoonists drive himself mad, like I have driven myself actually mad doing it. And it's just like, um, you know, made myself actually ill, and it's not, it's not good. You know, there's no point in worrying about those kind of things, I think. So that's why I've moved to work faster. And when it, in terms of, like, um, I sort of just got my... I'm not very good at keeping sketchbooks. I tend to just, like, draw things on whatever I can find, at the, you know, at the time or whatever. But when I do stories, it tends to be like... So Andrew and I were talking about this the other day, about whether it's the, the words or the image, or do you think visually? And I kind of think it's a bit of both. It's almost like an idea will sort of spring up and it will just sort of bubble and bubble and bubble until it has to come out. And sometimes that's words and sometimes that's pictures. But a bit like, I mean, I sort of mentioned earlier that I'll do scribbles. You probably won't be able to see anything like this, but this is sort of some sketches I did during the thunderstorm the other night um, in town. And um, it's just sort of... And then, so I will, I will like a particular drawing. I will, I will see if that, the spontaneity of it conveys something particularly, and then it'll be, it'll sit there and kind of bubble away until, until a story fits around it. And that will be the thing that tells me the format, the size, the panel structure, it just becomes quite intuitive, I guess. Mm -hmm. But I just, I do a lot of that work um, intellectually. So I, you know, I, I say I'm lazy because I draw quickly, but I, I do spend a lot of time thinking about it. And like, it's a bit like John Porcelino King Cat says, like, you know, I'll have an idea for a story or a picture or something, and I can, it can last with me, sit with you for years and years and years until suddenly the right combination of structure, idea, um, time comes out and you can, you can write that down. So. Do, you, do you draw back on like when you've done those little sketches? Do you look back at them when you're making the comic? Like um, do you try to retain something from those elements or are you, are you basically like that's the idea but you're starting anew? I mean, so for example, if I was going to do a comic about, about, about this, I would go back to this image and I would use that as, like I said at the beginning, as a kind of, I wouldn't trace it necessarily. I have traced stuff in the time but I would just sort of work kind of back from it. Kind yeah. of refining the... Yeah. Yeah, and obviously, I mean, you know, this is a square format, so um, I haven't drawn in square format before, pa panel-wise. So, but yeah, it's a, yeah. I guess I, my process keeps changing as well. So, but it's something about yeah. Andrew, what about those three different version things you do? What with the tracing paper, you mean? Yeah, you'll have like version variation one, variation two. Memory oh, memory right. right. Um, yeah. So the, these are it's become a series that I've done for the the comics workbook Tumblr. Um, and, and the way it works basically is uh, I'll do kind of an abstract page um, in color and then do a, a layer of tracing paper over it. And, and it's kind of a formal exercise. Um, I was actually going to say earlier that kind of, especially I think when you're doing kind of, kind of more experimental or abstract work as, as many of us are, kind of having a formal constraint for me, oftentimes it's a grid, um, but it can be the tools you use. Sometimes it's color palette. That can be really helpful. 
Um, so, so the pages that Frank's talking about, it's kind of a formal exercise where I'll draw kind of these abstract shapes in color and then overlay tracing paper and try to do, with, with black and white lines, um, kind of different versions of stories um, you know, using the shapes that I've already drawn without you know, trying to think beforehand about you know, what, what the comic might be. Um, some will have words, some won't. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and so it's just kind of trying to force myself to maybe think about the page a little differently and challenge myself in interesting ways. Frank, if I could g get one back at you. Um, with Pompeii, with, what, is, what, is your, what was your process with doing that? I mean, the, the drawings, if you haven't seen Pompeii, the drawings are very rough looking. Like, they're very sketchy. Often you can see kind of structure lines that were, were sketched in as he was kind of figuring out. Um, do you, is that like you do a page and it's done? Do you do one and maybe oh, no. you're there's, like, no, the, yeah, I'm No, there's lots of versions of those pages, but you'll never see them. Like, so. I mean, uh, is it like a new, are you starting a new page or you're like. No, editing? I'll literally just cut, you know, because I'll make this, I use basically the same layout for each page. So I'll just make a bunch of them. And then if I mess up on the page I'm working on, instead of trying to fix it or erase it, I'll just take a new piece of paper, put it on my light box draw, you know, or know where the size panel is, draw the new panel, and then just cut it out with scissors and put it on the old one. And okay. then just have a manuscript. So like in Pompeii, you can see tape lines where I'm putting down new panels. So I'm not, I'm trying to just keep going and I'm trying to get away from the preciousness of the page itself. And then I'll clean stuff up in Photoshop, but I, try, I won't, you know, I'll leave it a lot. Like in the production of it, I was gonna get rid of those tape marks. And then I started, after looking at them in the Xerox for a couple months while I was making it, I was like, well, it's fine. It's part of the making, you know? And, but there's versions of those panels that, you know, I was going a little crazy, like this one or this one or this one. And like friends of mine were like, it doesn't matter. It's fine. You know, like it still conveys the energy. So, or the emotion or whatever. But um, yeah, it's, it's because I'm working in a specific I call them time signatures, you know, like in my book, I, I'll either use like a particular grid or something and it's always, you know, it's, I know my timing and I'm thinking a lot about my timing. Yeah. Well, I, I just wanted to say that uh, I, I like the idea of a lot of uh, showing the sort of nuts and bolts of how you put something together. Like you said, you can see the tape. Mm -hmm. And uh, I feel like a lot of times, and talking before about sort of, uh, after you make something sort of intellectualizing it a bit for yourself to be okay with it or to, have it sort of mean something extra. Because uh, lots of times if there's sort of a mistake, what you would consider a mistake, or oh, you shouldn't see that there's these tape lines. But often I'll, I'll find that uh, if something's going on in a story, it'll almost make sense in the context of oh, the yeah. story. Mm -hmm. And uh, for instance, uh, I'm, I'm even maybe lazier than uh, going back and patching another piece of paper over, where like uh, my previous book is called Period, and one page shows a guy getting ready in the morning, and when he wakes up, he's wearing an undershirt, so you see his hairy forearm. And then like a few panels later, you see that he's wearing a boiler suit. And then you see him uh, reach his arm, but you just see his arm to turn the light switch, and his arm is bare again. So it makes absolutely no sense. But one intellectualization I had was, maybe this page is so smart, it's showing multiple days of him getting ready. <laughs> I'm also wondering, Frank, with, with Pompeii, I mean, I know that, like, we talked briefly about this earlier, there's, like, a narrative kind of sense of the way you drew that book with the, seeing the structure. Is, that, is there also kind of a, I don't know if political is the right word, but a almost like an educational sense of, like, you're trying to get out this idea of this kind of expressive looseness, letting things show? I'm, I'm trying to show that you can prop up the looseness with a, a firm structure and, you know... It's funny when people don't want to, I mean, I don't, all, like, Pompeii is not a grid. It's a grid, but it's like, I'm changing things. And then, you know, Peanuts is in a grid. And it's like some of the loosest, squiggliest drawing you've ever seen. And it's just one, two, three, four. That's it. You well, know, that's the, that's, the, that's the recipe. So it's like firm structure, loose drawing. That's cartooning, period. You well, know? I, I also like, uh, I like to think about lots of different types of art, like whether it's music or movies or comics, and finding similar things where I, I'm very into the idea of a very sort of sorted out, very firm structure. And like you're saying, within sort of a sloppy, or not sloppy, but a little bit looser uh, sort of execution of it. 
And I find, like, say, a, a, a band like King Crimson, where Robert Fripp is obviously a psychopath, and, uh, you know, he tunes his guitar like it's, a, you know, ironing board, or I don't know, some object that's not a guitar. Uh, but anyway, so if you listen to their music, it's, it's very highly structured, and there's sort of this... Uh, Oh, what's the name of the type of music they play? Math rock? Prog rock. Prog rock. Prog rock. Thank you. The, the Englishman helped me out on that <laughs> one. And, uh, but if you listen to their music, it's incredibly, incredibly sloppy and like wild sounding as compared to a band like Yes. Sure. So I feel like for me it can be very helpful if I'm working on you know, something on paper to not think about other things that are works on paper and say maybe I'll be like, hey, what's Robert Fripp up to today? And I'll think about how he plays guitar, and maybe that'll help me sort of think about drawing without having to think about drawing. Yeah, that's yeah. I like yeah. I like using music analogies a lot for drawing. I think um, everyone's been talking a lot about kind of drawing and and kind of process, and I'm also wondering about the kind of narrative element, like a narrative minimalism. Like like John's work, like I don't know, I would consider his work visually minimalist. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of panels, a lot of colors. But narratively, your work is like really minimal, and I'm wondering. I mean, can can you speak at all to that? Like, like the the way you're coming up with narratives, or like how you think about your the stories or not stories like you're telling. Yeah. Um, no, that's exactly it. I think it's um, what I do. I kind of I'm quite interested in 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 telling stories that you know th there isn't too much of a kind of tonal difference in 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 the in the story you know you, you focusing on on the um the kind of small details in the day and this kind of thing so my last book um dockwood was uh the first story in the book is 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 um is just a shift in a job and I, and i kind of it was a job i've i've had before and i've had many different jobs like it and i i i kind of almost started off really by thinking I'll just use that shift as the structure of the story, and then I'll kind of, you know, populate that that structure with with kind of as much, you know, life as I sort of can, or as much, you know, see how how much I can um, do with it. And so, I mean, the the initial kind of plan of the story essentially just looked like um, a kind of routine list <laughs> of the job, you know, like page four, wash up, page five chopped vegetables and you know but I was kind of uh, I was really interested in in just trying to make something very vivid and almost uh, intuitively kind of try and follow this character and 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 almost tell a story of a a place and just uh, play on themes really and um but just taking that starting point I mean for me I'm I'm I feel like I'm I'm really uh, I'm, I'm quite I've only been really uh trying to create stories in the last, you know, well, I, it, it's, I still feel like quite, um, I'm learning with everything I do and getting more confident, really. So that was a kind of a starting point. But um, the, in in this particular story, there's there's a whole page devoted to just chopping vegetables and things. And I just love the, the routine. I, I, I wanted to show the routine of that. And I, I, I really like chopping vegetables. But I think the um, radio's playing in that scene, yeah, too. Yeah. And there's, like, all kinds of... So he's exactly, got all this stuff yeah. going on. Like, it'll be, like, a bird going by and, like, radio's playing and chopping. But he's, you know, he's, you know... I mean, there's... It's very dense. And it's and visually, it's just not... I know you're saying it's just chopping vegetables, but mm -hmm. it's just as layered as having three different characters having three different voices, I think, you know. I... I I th this, there was something with pages like that I, I enjoyed. Um, I mean, the, the, st I, the starting point for that page really was I just, I do um, find, I used to really enjoy it. I, you know, I, when I've had jobs chopping vegetables for a whole building, you know, <laughs> chopping potatoes, I got really into it and had a really good technique. I was really good at it. <laughs> like, um, and there's a satisfaction and this sort of, almost, the, uh, there's a kind of sensual sort of, um, the, the, uh, the being in a building at seven thirty in the morning in 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 a kind of suburb, with the kind of window open, the kind of the radio playing, and the the kind of um, incidentals of 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 the the song that might be on the radio. This the image you just get these little moments that are just just it just in general life and those kind of things that just feel 
just feel kind of special and, uh, and not in a particularly logical way. But so. sometimes, you know, those are like the best parts of the, like, let's, I'll just use a movie as an example. Mm -hmm. It's like a movie will start and it'll have this great montage of, of scenes like that. And then the narrative, quote unquote, yeah. starts and it it's, horrible you know yeah, yeah. you know what i mean yeah, and it's yeah, just like yeah. I, would, I would have just watched around an hour and a half of the you know the bird and the radio <laughs> and the chopping vegetables or whatever you know I like yeah i think that's that's something that i really uh, i i've kind of come to kind of realize and i feel like as soon as you if i put anything too unexpected and 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 um and a, a bigger incident in the, in the story, it would. It's almost like if you're doing a. Um, I kind of think of it kind of tonally. If you, if I'm doing a a a, a drawing with uh, maybe very pale greys with watercolor, and and very very subtle, you know, you different hatching with different greys. As soon as you do a black line, like a jet black line on top of it, it's just all the greys are gone. You don't notice them. You know, they're just muddied. You know, so. Mm. And and I feel narratively there's there's a similar sort of um, effect, you know, if you have this kind of jet black of a kind of big narrative arc. That's what I think is interesting with Simon and Andrew is because then th sometimes there's so few marks on the page that there can be a loudness and softness per panel per page that really is apparent, is way more apparent than a, like a cacophony that we're used to in most comics, you know. Yeah, I, I think for me, and I mean, I don't know how Simon feels, but I would say this is true for his work as well. There's there's a lot of drawings, you know, individual panels that on their own, you know, they're, they're minimalist to the point of complete abstraction, you know, without context, you know, you wouldn't be able to tell what they are simply, you know, like Simon mentioned the the geese that he draws in one of his books, Grand Gestures, and you know, they're, they're like three lines, it's like two circles and then, you know, a neck. Right, right. So it's, you know, it's, it's minimalism, you know, pushed as far as it can go. And I think what's really interesting in comics is, you know, if you put those images in context, you know, if you have, you know, a few very kind of straightforward narrative panels, and then, like Frank was saying, you kind of push it toward in, the, in the direction of minimalism or abstraction, then bring it back again, you know, those very directly abstract images can have a real narrative and thematic weight, and that's something I think you can only do in comics. Good. Yeah, no, I think I definitely think so as well. Um, it's not just about being lazy after all, but I was going to say something, <laughs> and I've, I've just about forgotten what I was going to say. Yes, narrative. Yes, yeah, so no, I think that that's true. And the reason that I like to kind of sort of pull back and, and let people try to kind of sort of have that moment of kind of uh, sometimes it's a moment of disruption, and they, I guess people go, what? what? And then sometimes it's like, okay, it's been more seamless, but it's about. Uh, and the same with uh, John's work, and definitely with, with Andrew's in that sense of an evocation of place or a moment or a particular. Or, or being aware of what it's of what is around you at a particular moment, or thinking in a particular way about something. Because with autobiograph autobiography, I've never really been interested in like doing. I'm a, this is a story, and I went here, and these some people that I met, and then I did that, and then you know I drew a comic about drawing comics, and and it's and I find that quite. I mean, I read work like that and enjoy it, but it's just not something that feels right for me. So, increasingly, I've been moving towards this idea of. Um, that talking head song, Once in a Lifetime, where he's going like, how the hell, how did I get here? This is not my beautiful wife, it's not my beautiful house. And basically, that's kind of the vibe I'm interested in my comics. It's like looking back, and, and you know, I'm aware that like, it's my most recent one, which is Smooth 7, available from D13B, wherever I'm sitting. Anyway, with that one, is um, it's, it's like, okay, so it's about the place that I grew up, but it's really about, I just turned 30 and I hadn't been back there in 20 years, so what role did that place have in my life? But... It's, so the book isn't really necessarily even about that. It's about, like, have you guys all grown up somewhere? What, what role does that play in your life? And I think that having the affordance of comics that lets you tell a bit of a story and then drop something out where you have to go, oh, what's happening? Fill in those blanks narratively is, helps that kind of connection, I hope. I mean, I trust what I try and do anyway with the reader. Ho hopefully people go, and they can follow that kind of emotional thread and think about your own experience in relation to what I'm doing because it's about connection and communication, not about... Um, being didactic, it's not like I'm telling you a story and listening, I'm hoping it's something that you can relate and interact with, I think. So again, I mean, I, 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 I'm noticing, like, as I'm talking, actually, that, like, I have quite an emotional and intuitive kind of relationship with how I draw, rather than necessarily a, I don't verbalise it, like, in terms of formality of practice or anything like that, or process. Right. Like, yeah. I, that's it's like a, music, yeah. it's like trying to say why you play that note or something, it's very yeah. difficult. 
But Derek's kind of getting off easy here because, you know, Derek's one of the most interesting minimalist comics makers out there. And he makes really interesting work. And I think that maybe because he doesn't have a uh, as recognizable drawing style or something. I don't something. draw anymore at all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nevertheless, um, you are a great image maker and you're a great collagist. And I think you take different sources and things like that. And so you're kind of... You know, you're coming at comics in this like collagist approach too, you know, but sort of in the same school, you know. So what do you if you're not drawing, how do you feel about what all we're talking about? Well, I think I, I mean I was thinking of the, about this as I'm I'm listening to everyone. Um and like like earlier I was talking with Simon and he like doesn't he doesn't have like a have read a lot of comics. He doesn't know who Jack Kirby is. Um and I was thinking about how what the work the work I do is I do it very much in opposition to what most people are doing, like a reaction against most comics. So like I'm like, okay, everyone's drawing, I'm not gonna draw anymore, or you know, every, everyone's drawing, I'm gonna make photos or something like that. Um, but I found it interesting um, listening to everyone and kind of knowing a little of the background of how that's not the case for everyone. Like people are coming to that from like Simon's not like making his style of comics because he's like. Oh, I you know I read superhero comics and I want them. I want to do something different, or I want it to be, you know, I can do this better or whatever. And I think I don't know. I get the feeling John maybe doesn't have like didn't come from like lots of comics. Like you came to it by way of something, like something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think. And like I like Chris also, but like like Andrew, I think you. I mean you, you uh, you have like a background in reading yeah. manga. I think a lot. Yeah. And so, I think that's interesting that we, that we kind of come to that from different ways. Because for me, it's very much like I want to do the opposite of what other people are doing. Well, I would say that uh, as much as, as I've tried to talk about fancy stuff, uh, my I do have a background in comics, but it's almost like this er history for me, where when I was like eight and nine, I read Mad Magazine and Calvin and Hobbes and Peanuts and basically uh, like black and white line art, either like Sunday comic strips or the stuff you'd find in the newspaper. So I started reading comics that were, you know, just sort of gag stuff or funny stuff that was in a lot of ways extremely minimal. And then I sort of completely missed the boat on like 24 page, you know, pamphlet comics, whether they were superhero comics or any other kind of comics. So when I finally got back around to making comics, uh, it was kind of like there was this stuff jumbled up in my, you know, wherever my eight-year-old mind still was, so that when I did start to make comics, I feel like even though I had seen lots of other comics in the meantime, maybe the type of stuff I was drawn to was, uh, you know, more Dilbert than X-Men, even, even if I don't want to make a Dilbert comic. That makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I think that's quite interesting because I noticed this. I mean, the UK scene is a, is is a bit different to here. I mean, it's kind of fairly comparable, but there's this kind of um, established normative question that gets asked in interviews, which is, "Oh, how did you get to go and do comics?" People say, "Oh, well, as a kid, I read sort of peanuts. Then I went read the Marvel, and then I forgot, didn't do anything for a little while, and then I found indie comics and blah blah blah." And it creates a kind of false um, narrative almost about this kind of connection between these things. And I kind of so the way that I see my stuff is that I write stories or poems that, that are pictures that I publish as zines and that they happen to be comics. So I find myself That's in That's fucking world. cool. I wish everybody could really... I wish that could be the dominant attitude here. But it's like, but, but the thing about that, I mean, you don't get, I mean, people in the UK don't really understand that at all, but I, that's kind of how I, I, I kind of feel it. So it's funny you say Peanuts and uh, Calvin Hobbes because those, those are probably two on some level, the biggest, I guess, spiritual in terms of the content of the stuff that I do, influence. It's about like a sense of wonderment and place, and it's a sense about being a bit of a miserable git as well. And um, uh, but also, you know, peanuts is sort of beautiful as well. And yeah, lots of black and white stuff in, in peanuts. I used to like we we're just saying before we came in. I used to kind of uh, hide under the covers at night, read these tiny little uh, the coronet paper back editions of peanuts or whatever. And that has more of a bearing on me than than any comic I may or may not have read in between. And I, it's because I don't make a link between like a story link, I just see that like that was something that was really important to me, but I also read like, I lived in the countryside and loved fantasy novels and there's something about like looking at the world in a particular way and poetry that's probably had more of an influence on me as a maker than Jack Kirby, I guess. <laughs> so it, 
you know, I'm, yeah. I'm being slightly facetious. But. but but that's good. I mean, that's good because comics has now like really hit this, you know, critical mass where you can have, I call them vertical invaders. You know, you just have these people that drop out of nowhere that never made comics and they don't have to be, you know, come up within the tradition of comics and that's fantastic. And it'll bring, you know, more comics to the table. The problem that I have with a lot of like abstract comics, so to speak, from the last decade or so is that it's just this thing of wanting to be so clever about like <laughs> wanting to make you know clever abstraction and isn't this is a comic and this is a comic and it's like kinda and it, it just it, nothing ever really hooks me and now I think I'm seeing something different stuff come out of that like like I your stuff isn't like like novelty stuff you know like the collage stuff that you do like might have a serious narrative component that's really interesting and it's just not like cheeky or something you know and like that's the thing that bugged me was that it was just more this like I'm, we might not draw or whatever and we'll make these things but it just has to be like they don't want to I don't not saying you have to take yourself seriously but just it's like when you as someone who consciously sets themselves in opposition to a lot of things that can backfire as well. And so just like you put a restriction on to be freed, then sometimes you take that restriction off. And so you keep going. And so like I think now what you see, or at least what I've seen, I mean, you know, Bill Boy Shell, you know, my mentor when I'm 15, he was making abstract comics and people were like, what the fuck is this? You know, but now people don't necessarily say that kind of thing. But so it's not like abstraction and drawing, I mean, we're taking all these different ideas, but now it's like finally hitting fruition that it's not like just a joke or something anymore. And that's what I, f I find really interesting, you know. Well, I, when you were saying it, I was thinking about something that I like to think about where you said it, it's very interesting. There are a lot of people sort of coming from nowhere to make comics, uh, whether they've, you know, read lots of books or into art or into movies or whatever it is. So you basically have these people who have very little baggage Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. comics is one of those things where I feel like oh, yeah. where baggage is the status. Yeah. Uh, oh, but yeah. <laughs> but uh, to make a sort of analogy, like comics are sort of a bastard art where you have, you know, basically still images and text in the same way that movies are sort of a bastard art where you have, you know, basically photography and sound. And uh, but in early movies, uh, directors had no baggage, like uh, right. you know, early early directors in the teens and twenties, because essentially no one had made movies before. Right on. And if you watch those movies, they're completely bonkers. Right. And and <laughs> they had to invent a POV shot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I feel like watching, uh, you know, like The Navigator or something like that, uh, the Buster Keaton movie. If you watch that, you know. You sit there for like 68 minutes or however long it is, and you're like, what the hell is that? I thought yeah. like my grandma's supposed to be into this right. kind of stuff. <laughs> and, I, and I feel like uh, because I equate comics and movies because they're sort of uh, don't really make a whole lot of sense because they're combining two different things. And in the same way that lots of movies that are not very good are basically like filmed plays. Uh, but then you have movies that couldn't be anything but movies. Uh, like I'm a big fan of Robert Bresson, and his movies basically, you can't imagine them being anything but a movie. Right. And I feel like there's something happening in comics now where you have people who don't even know what comic books are or have read DC or Marvel comics. Because it's text and image, so now it's the internet, right? Text and image, text and image, it's the fucking internet. So web now web 2.0. <laughs> <laughs> Comics 2.0, I guess. Wait, should we do questions? I think people are getting ready. Yeah, I think we're... I wanted to definitely um, give people, in case anyone has been thr thrilled by what people have said, that you want to run out to the to the floor before everyone closes at 6. You might want to pick up right. these gentlemen's books. Questions? But it, Yeah, does anyone have anything... You just want to get out of here? Perhaps not, not, not super long-winded? I do. Um, oh. We're recording oh, it, so... Um, no, we have to, you have to do it. Cool. I was just curious from a process standpoint, um, each of you, how much time you spend uh, revising your pages versus being happy with um, the original product that you laid out? Or do you revise at all? 
I think, I think we kind of learned uh, that. I would just say I spend zero amount of time. And one page per book I tear up and I'm very upset with. And then I cool out. So one page per book I screw up on and freak out. But other than that, zero amount of time. John? Um, I spend a lot of time preparing. But when it comes to actually inking a, a final page, I, I give myself like a day to do it. And I, I, I kind of... I just I just do it, and I, I very sometimes I kind of scratch away the ink when it's dried, and but it's kind of hard to 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 correct. So you know, it's, it tends to be it's almost like I'm practicing, practicing, and then I've got I've got to go live and do it, and then it's done kind of thing. Yeah, my process is yeah, there's like I said, there's a lot of intellectual kind of like thinking and kind of getting the right frame of mind. But when I actually sit down and and do it, maybe I'll do a couple of versions of a panel or a page quite quickly, and then one will stick, one won't. So my process is much faster now so I, I would say I kind of don't I don't revise I just draw it again but because it's so fast it doesn't feel like it's a, a labor anymore I, I go through a number of drafts not for the drawings the drawings are never revised but for the sequence a lot of times I'll take again because I'm working in grids um, lately um, it's very easy to kind of take panels out or sometimes even to rearrange panels because to me you know kind of the sequences sequencing is really interesting it's also quite important so there's a lot of revision there and I do everything in Photoshop, so I have the undo key. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? No? Well, Wait, in, hold on in lieu second. of everything that's been said over the course of in lieu of everything that's been said over the course of this panel, this is gonna sound really trivial, but I still feel like it's worth asking. Have you really never heard of Jack Kerr? <laughs> <laughs> I've heard his name, but I don't really know who he was or what he did. Um, You're so lucky. I know, but I, I think I know. I know more about the fact that people talk about him than I do about him himself. I think. Like Walt Disney. Disney. Yeah. <laughs> any, I mean, any other afterwards, questions? if somebody wants to tell me who he is, that that will. Be oh right. God. <laughs> All right. Uh, one more. Hi. Um, I just have a quick question. Um, like. I really love all of your work, and um, but had I picked up any of your work like five years ago, I would have been like, I don't get it. What is this? And um, it took me a while with art to understand minimal work and minimal fine art. And has your response to your work been a lot more like people who are in the field and who are really into comics, really into your work? Or are you getting people who have just never been reading comics being like, wow, I love this? Um, I'm just interested in the response you're getting uh, to your work from the public in general. Uh, I, I would say that the two groups you named, which is comic makers and people who have no idea about comics, are the people who have liked my stuff the most, whereas people who maybe don't make comics but like comics don't like my work. I think everyone I've ever given or sold a comic to makes comics. <laughs> um, I think basically, yeah, what you said is basically the same, same for me, actually, yeah. Um, to pick up on a different aspect of your point, I mean, I, I totally agree with you, actually, that a lot of our work is really challenging and perhaps unappealing when you first see it. And, and you know, like, even for myself, like, you know, the first couple times I saw their work, like, it didn't really appeal to me. Um, but I think, like, it's worth kind of challenging yourself in that way because I think some of my favorite cartoonists now, including the, these guys, are people who, you know, perhaps didn't appeal to me at all when I first saw their work. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, thank you. Okay. Thanks for coming.